I want you to turn in your Bible to how many passages? Two. Two, that's correct. To Genesis chapter 1 and to 1 Chronicles 29. Genesis 1 and 1 Chronicles 29. This is the last message in the series, Created to Be. And we've talked about four words that describe God's process in our lives as believers. And these four words also describe our desire at Gateway Church for every member of our church. So I want us to say them together. Every campus, we'll put them up on the screen. I told you it'd be a pop quiz, but I'll I'll, I'll go ahead and let it be an open book test, all right? So we're going to put the words on the screen. I want us to say them, all the campuses, out loud together. So the four words are believing, belonging, becoming, and building. All right, I'm going to say them again. Believing, belonging, becoming, and building. And this way we're going to talk about building. Now, the, the scripture that God gave us to base these four words on is right where you are in your Bibles. Genesis 1, look at verse 26. Then God said, let us make man, and I talked the first week about how I see that as describing believing, in our image, belonging, according to our likeness, becoming, and let them mankind, man, male and female, have dominion, that would be building, over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, the reason I wanted to show you that verse again and read all of it, I have just been reading part of it, is because he gives the list of what we're supposed to have dominion over. And God shows us, even in Genesis 1, he was building. God began by building. So, I have three points this week, all right? So, here's point number one. God is a builder. God is a builder. He built the universe. He built everything you see. When you see a beautiful mountain, God built it. When, When you see a great sunset, God built it. And according to scientists, apparently, he's still building because our universe is still expanding. It's just something that God does. It's in his nature to build. Now, if you're in Genesis 1, we'll get to 1 Chronicles 29 in a moment. Look look at chapter 2, because I want to show you, it it goes into detail of how he built man and woman, male and female. Uh, Genesis 2, verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, if you look at the word formed, remember that word formed, God formed Adam, male, okay? And then Genesis 2.22, it says, then the rib which the Lord God had taken for man, he made, remember the word made, into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Now, here's the reason I want to show you those, those two words. Formed, literally in the, in the Hebrew, means squeezed. In other words, here's how God made Adam. He reached down and he grabbed some dirt, he squeezed it, he blew in it, and set Adam down. That's it. This word made for Eve actually means built. He built Eve. Okay, here's what I think. Here's what he did. He does like this. Adam squeezes, and then he goes over here. Mm, That's good. So, I'm not trying to, you know, I know we live in a seductive society. I'm not trying to say that, but I'm telling you, God did a good job with women. And he worked on them for a while. Us, he just, you know, that was it. It's done. Matter of fact, if you're sitting beside your wife, not, not another, don't do this to a strange woman. If you're sitting beside your wife, turn to her right now and say, God did a good job. Because he did a good job. Now, when he built things, he built everything he built with a purpose. Everything. And I want to just show you how he builds because it's really amazing. And if you're, you can look back at chapter 1 there. Uh, when God built something, let me make this statement so we understand where I'm going. When God built something, he spoke to what he wanted it to be built from, to what he wanted it to be sustained by, and to what he wanted it to return to. Now, I know I dangle a lot of prepositions there, but um, don't worry about it, all right? Just follow me, okay? When God wanted to build something, he spoke to what he wanted it to come from, 
to what he wanted it to be sustained by and depended upon and what he wanted to return to. Now, so let me, let me show you what I'm saying. Verse 11 says, let the earth bring forth, and I'm going to paraphrase, grass and plants and herbs and trees, okay? So God says to the earth, bring forth trees and plants. Here's the reason I'm telling you that. Trees come from dirt, are sustained by dirt, and go back to dirt. Uh, Verse 20, let the waters abound with fish. Fish are sustained by water. Verse 24, let the earth bring forth, again paraphrasing, animals. The Bible says living creatures and cattle and beasts of every kind. Okay, animals come from dirt, are sustained by dirt, and go back to dirt. So when God wanted something to build something, he spoke to what he wanted it to come from, to be sustained by and to return to. Now, why am I saying that's important? Remember our key verse in the series. Verse 26, when God wanted us, he spoke to himself. When God wanted us, he spoke to himself. Verse 26 says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Okay. We came from God. We are sustained by God and we return to God. We came from God. Now, here's what you're thinking, because we just read it in chapter 2, verse 7. You're thinking, wait, no, wait, wait, wait. We, we, uh, we came from the dirt. No, no, no. Our bodies came from the dirt. My body came from the dirt, is sustained by the dirt, and goes back to the dirt. But my spirit came from God, is sustained by God, and goes back to God. I, we came from God. God built us out of himself. That's what I want you to see. Now, my body is sustained by dirt. My body is sustained by fruits and vegetables and ice cream and things like that that come from dirt. (laughs) Well, uh, ice cream, you know, cows eat grass. They make milk. And so ice cream is healthy. That's my theory. So ice cream, when you really think about it, ice cream is processed salad. (laughs) Now... I, I know we talked a few months ago about eating healthy, and by the way, I am. Uh, you, if you haven't, so I'm, I'm eating healthy and I'm working out, uh, and I've lost 16 pounds in three since, uh, you know, the end of November, whenever it was. Um, but I wasn't doing it to lose weight. It's like a benefit. It's like giving. You give because you love God, but the benefit is then you get under God's blessing. I think it's the same way with our bodies. And so if the Lord spoke that to you when I shared that, I want to. Uh, invite you to continue that, all right? Now, what would happen if a plant said to the dirt, I'm pulling out. (laughs) I'm going to make it on my own. What would happen? Say it. What would happen? It'd die. Man said to God, I'm pulling out. God said, the day you do, you'll die. Our bodies didn't die because our bodies came from dirt, are sustained by dirt and go back to dirt. Our spirits died. We died when sin entered the world. And Jesus came not only to bring abundant life, but life. Uh, Ephesians 2 says it this way, and he, you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. God not only built us, you ready for this? He rebuilt us. He not only created us, he recreated us in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's why in this series, I've said we were born this way, but we were born again this way. We, we were 
born a certain way, but God recreated us in Christ. God is a builder, and everything you see, he built. It did not just happen. There are uh, the famous story about George Washington cutting down the cherry tree, but there are many, many stories about George Washington and his father teaching him lessons as a little boy. One is that George's father one day went out when George wasn't there, and a place where George would go on their land, and his father planted cabbage in the shape of George's name. He actually planted cabbage and spelled out George Washington. George Washington, in cabbage. And of course, it took a while for it to come up, and then one day, George comes running in the house, and he says, Dad, Dad, come here, you gotta see this. He takes the back, he says, look at this. That's my name, my name right there in the cabbage. And the father said to him, isn't that amazing? how that just happened by chance. And George stood there a minute and he said, I think you planted that. And his father said, son, I did plant that because I wanted you, I planted that so I could tell you about your real father. And he said, well, dad, aren't you my real father? He said, I'm your earthly father. But your heavenly father designed all of this for us, and it didn't just happen by chance. So we have a designer and a builder. His name is God. So God is a builder. Here's number two. God is building his house. When you study scripture, God is building his house. Um, we are the dwelling place of God. We'll get to 1 Chronicles 29 in a minute. A couple of scriptures. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 says, you are God's building. Isn't that a great scripture? You are God's building. 1 Peter 2, 5 says, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built, watch the word built in here many times, on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, talking about the body of Christ, being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. That's God's purpose, is to build us as a place where he can dwell. Now, if we're God's building, I have a question for you. Why do we build buildings? I mean, if we're God's building, why do we build buildings? Well, because the Bible tells us to gather together, to be fed, to be, if you want to go right down the line, saved, healed, set free, discipled, equipped, empowered, and to be serving somewhere. So the reason that we would build a building, buildings are only tools. The reason we build a building is simply to reach more people. That's the only reason. Buildings are only tools for the kingdom of God. And we build a building because in that building, God meets with us. As a matter of fact, did you know that we are the house of God, but buildings where God meets with his people are also called the house of God in Scripture? And they are because God meets with us there. Exodus 25, 22 says, and there I will meet with you. Speaking of the tabernacle, I will meet with you and I will speak with you. Genesis 28, 16 and 17, Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. Watch, this is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of of heaven. The New Living Translation says gateway of heaven. It's one of our foundational scriptures here at the church. Man, this, this is the house of God. Now, why did he say that? Because the Lord was in that place. And Jesus, referring to the temple that Solomon built, referring to a building, Jesus says, and he said to them, Matthew 21, 13, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it the end of thieves. Now, he's talking about the building where God's people gather. So now go to 1 Chronicles 29, and I want to show you this building. David had it in his heart to build a place for God's people to meet with God. 
And God told David, as most of you know, that David would not build it, but Solomon would build it. But David gave many of his resources for it, and he led the people to give willingly to this temple. All right, 1 Chronicles, we're going to read quite a few scriptures here, all right? 1 Chronicles 29, verse 3. David says, moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I've prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure of gold and silver. Now, this is what it says on our commitment card, by the way. This is the commitment we're making. Over and above what we're already giving to the house because we've set our affection on God's house and the purpose for God's house. Uh, Now, watch how the people respond. Look down at verses 5 and 6. He begins to list things, the gold for things of gold, the silver for things of silver, and for all kinds of work to be done by the hands of craftsmen. And then he asks the people this question, and I really want to ask you this this weekend by the Spirit of God. Watch this question. Who then is willing, watch the word willing because we're going to talk about it, willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? And he's talking about giving to the house of God, the work of the kingdom. Who is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? Then the leaders of the father's houses, that's every family, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captains of thousands and of hundreds, with the officers over the king's work, offered willingly. Look at verse 9. Then the people rejoiced, for they had offered willingly, because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord, and King David also rejoiced greatly. That's one of the reasons I rejoice so much at Gateway Church, because you offer willingly. It's one of the reasons that we have offering boxes instead of passing the plate. It's because I want every person to give willingly, not by compulsion. Uh, Look at verse 14. David is praying now. He says, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you, and of your own we have given to you. Notice, in other words, we got it from you, we just gave it back to you. First Chronicles 29, verse 17. I know also, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. And now with joy, I've seen your people who are present here to offer willingly to you. Now, stay there. I'll come back to 1 Chronicles 29. This is Solomon's temple. Let me show you when they gave to the building of the tabernacle, which was what Moses led them to. Exodus 35, verse 5, take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as an offering to the Lord. That's what the Lord was telling Moses. Verse 22 of Exodus 35, they came, both men and women, as many as had a willing heart. And chapter 35, again, same chapter, verse 29, the children of Israel brought a free will offering to the Lord, all the men and women whose hearts were willing. By the way, the word free will is in the Bible 18 times. Every time it refers to giving an offering to the Lord. Every time. They offered willingly. I I just have to tell you, I'm so proud of you because most people tithe and most people get willing offerings over and above. When we come and we say, listen, we want to expand God's work. We want to expand it. And that's what we're doing right now with a heart for the kingdom offering and, and commitments over this next year. And what's great is there's no manipulation. I don't want you to ever feel that. It's between you and God. And it's whatever you willingly offer to the Lord. And then when you go back to 1 Chronicles 29, verse 18, David's praying now. Listen listen to this prayer. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep this, this is willing giving, keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of the heart of your people and fix their heart toward you. Uh, About a month ago, Go. I got a letter from a guy here in the church, and he said uh, uh, September a year ago, so it'd be about a year and a half now, uh, I was preaching on something, and I just made the comment, 
I, I, we're, I'm talking about giving everything to God. Our whole heart, our lives, really, really giving to God, serving to God. And I wasn't talking about finances. I was in another series, didn't say a word about finances in the message. I was just talking about us giving to God. And um, one of the, uh, um, I, I got to tell you this, I was being interviewed a few months ago for a, a magazine article, and they asked me, Pastor Robert, how often do you preach on giving? And I said, every week. And they said, what? I said, well, I think you're asking me, how often do I preach on giving money? And that's been every two to three years at Gateway, as far as a series on finances and giving. But I said, I preach on giving every week. Because you can't preach on prayer and not talk about giving. You can't preach on marriage and not talk about giving. You, you can't preach on faith and not talk about giving. You, you can't ask people to come to Christ and not talk about giving. We always are giving. It's just who we are. But we also give our finances. So, so I said something about giving, but not about finance. I just talked about giving like that. And this guy was sitting in the congregation, and the Lord said to him, I'm talking to you. Just like that. And he said, well, Lord, uh, I give. And the Lord said to him, not the tithe. He said, you give every now and then what you want when you want, but you don't regularly tithe. So you haven't given me everything. So he said, I went home and I set it up as an automatic draft out of my account. So I couldn't argue about it anymore. And he said, I can't tell you immediately the peace that came in my home. He said, we just had strife. We had a great marriage, great kids, but there was strife in our home. He said, it stopped immediately. Immediately. He said, I can't tell you about the peace that came in our offices. And we had this, and he said, immediately. And he said, here's the other thing. For the first time in my life, I knew God was going to take care of me. I just knew it. Because I was doing it God's way now instead of my way. I was doing it God's way. So this is in September now, a little over a year ago. In October... They met with him and said, uh, we're going to dissolve your department in the company. The very next month. And you, you hear about these giving testimonies people gave and then immediately get a raise? Okay. They fired him. <laughs> he said, but Robert, in the meeting, I had this peace. And he said, you know what the first thought came to my mind? I wonder what God's going to do. That's what I thought. I wonder what God's going to do now. That's what he thought. So he starts praying about it, and the Lord gives him an idea for a company. So he tells his company, hey, I have this idea. His, his, now, his department, his job ends December 31st, and he said, I have an idea for a company, and he tells them about it. Now, listen to what they said. They said, we'd like to invest in it. So on December 31st, he stops. He, loses, he leaves his job. January 1st, he starts his company. The company where he was gave him a full year of full salary and benefits for a year. And invested in his new company. So he begins at January 1st a year ago. This past December 31st, one year later, listen to what he wrote me. He sold it for $11.7 million in one year. And he said, now, because I had investors, my part is $6.5 million. And he said, I wanted to write and exp tell you this story and send my first fruits check, my tithe to the Lord. Isn't that great? When we understand this, and when we give willingly, and that's all I want you to ever do, is give willingly, God takes care of the rest. In The God I Never Knew, Robert Morris explains that the Holy Spirit's chief desire is for a relationship with you to offer the encouragement and guidance of a trusted friend. I want you to understand that all of these gifts, all of God's gifts have to do with ministering to people and they have to do with encouraging people. It's time to experience the Holy Spirit in a fresh new way to meet the God you may have never known. You have someone living inside of you who knows everything about everything. And he has committed himself to be your teacher and to lead you into all truth.
Number one, God is a builder. Number two, God is building his house. But here's some really good news that a lot of people miss. Number three, God is building your house. Remember, God's a builder. I want you to know something. He's not just interested in his house. He's interested in building your house. Now, remember, David said, I want to build God a house. Matter of fact, he calls Nathan the prophet, and he said, I want to build God a house. And Nathan said, go ahead and do it. And then he goes and prays, and the Lord says, no. Tell him, it's, he's not going to. Solomon's going to do it. And then he lists these things. This is in First Chronicles 17. He lists these things that he's going to do in response to David wanting to build him a house. And let me show you one thing the Lord says to him. Uh, verse 10 He says, furthermore, I tell you that the Lord will build you a house. The Lord will build you a house. And then later in the chapter, David is now responding to the Lord. He's praying. And in verse 25, he says, for you, O my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build him a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray before you. Now, I just, I found that scripture, those two scriptures right there this week when God spoke this message to me. But let me tell you how God put this in my own life. Years ago, uh, many of you know our giving testimony that Debbie and I gave away our first home. And so we're in a rental home. And so I start praying about budgeting to be able to get a down payment and closing costs to buy another home. I don't know how long we're gonna be in the rental home, but I start looking at the budget. And so I decide, you know what? I think I could save $15,000 over three years about $100 a week we could put into savings for this. And um, so we're approximately 15000 over three years. And then we'll have 10 for a down payment and 5 for a closing call. So that was just my thinking, okay? We go to church and they announce a building campaign. Three years. And immediately the Lord said, would you give me that 15000 And I said, absolutely, Lord. I'd love to give that to you. So we filled out the commitment card, made that commitment. We began fulfilling that commitment. And I don't remember when it was during that time, but I think it was only a a few months or a year or maybe even two years into it. I'm not sure. I don't remember at this point. But someone told us about a home we could buy for no money down. That got me excited. Those three words, no money down, (laughs) you know. And uh, so we went and looked at it. And uh, it, was, it had been foreclosed on. It needed some repairs. But we prayed about it. We thought, well, this is it. Well, the company that owned it said, you know, we don't want him to go in and start spending money on repairs and not make the payments. So go in and do an estimate. Let's figure out some repairs. And so they started figuring things up. And they said, really, the carpet's horrible. It needs new carpet. It needs new flooring. Uh, the uh, AC units are old. So they, start, they come back to me and said, listen, we're going to do some repairs. And since you're, it's already under contract, it's already under contract, as is, they didn't have to do anything, then we're, we're, we'll let you pick the paint and flooring and things like that. So we go pick out all this stuff and don't spend any on it. And we get to closing and the real estate person says to me, I've never seen this, this company do this before. And she said, you have no idea how much they spent own repairs for your home and upgrades. And I said, yes, I do. <laughs> I said, I, I think they spent 15000 She said, I'm not supposed to show you this, but she turned the paper around, and it was $15,000, exactly what we gave. Now, when that happened, the Lord said to me, son, if you'll build my house, I'll build your house. But I don't think he was simply talking about that. Matter of fact, I don't think that was a very big part of it all. Because I watched him build my family. I've watched all of our kids find godly mates. I've watched my relationship with Debbie and my relationship with my kids. I've watched God build my home. When we're concerned about God's house, he's concerned about our house. So today we're going to do two things. We're going to give a one-time offering. I brought my check with me today to give. So, and it's an extravagant offering. I, for Debbie and I, I always feel like that I should never ask the church to do something I'm not willing to do. And so we're going to give an extravagant amount for us. And extravagant for some people is this much, and extravagant for some is this much. 
So we're going to have a one-time gift today for Heart for the Kingdom. And then we're going to take the commitment card. If, if you have your worship guide there, uh, you take the commitment card out, and it's right in the middle, and you can tear it out. And I didn't fill mine out before the service, so I could do it in the service and give with you. Um, but it says, there's an amount, is the amount I am committing to give over and above my tithes. Over and above. So this doesn't include your tithe. It does include what you're giving today as your, your offering. So that's what you're going to, so you're, if you give a, a certain amount today, and then whatever you're going to give. Now, here's what I want you to know. It doesn't have to be exact. Because so many times we think, well, if I make a commitment, I want to fulfill that. I'm asking for an estimate. Do you give 1% over your tithe? Do you give 2% over your tithe? Uh, or do you give a certain amount? Do you have an amount from the Lord? Do you feel like God has said, listen, I want you to give this amount this next year. I want you to give this much in the offering. And before next year, I want you to give this amount. I, I don't know what the Lord would say to you. But I have both of those. I have the check that I'm giving today. And I have the amount that I'm going to give over and above for the next year. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a moment and pray about it. Ask the Lord. Um, if you're married, talk to your spouse. Hopefully you came prepared to give because we talked about it for the last two weeks. If you didn't, that's okay. But in just a moment, we're going to stand at all the campuses and we're going to have containers here at the front. We have containers here at the front. And so at all campuses and if you're in an overflow room. And here's what I'd like for you to do. When we stand up to worship, we're going to have one more worship song. We will have ministry time at the altar after the service, at the end of the service. So if you need prayer, we still want to pray for you. But during this song, I want us to come and give two offerings, two, two things. Let me say that. An offering for Heart for the Kingdom and um, a commitment card. And I really want to ask every member of the church to make a commitment. Whatever God tells you. Because I've watched fruit in people's lives as they made a commitment to build God's house. And if you haven't been here for a few weeks on the back are some of the initiatives of where, the, uh, where this offering is going to go. So, I want you to pray about it. I want you to seek the Lord. When we stand up, if you're ready, some of you came ready to do it, then you can just start coming as soon as we stand in just a moment. After I pray, we'll stand, and you can begin coming. If you're not ready, then just take a moment, pray about it. Here's the other thing. Maybe you don't have your checkbook with you. You can go home, and you can give online, and you can designate it toward Heart for the Kingdom. Uh, if you really feel like you can't make the commitment because you need to go home and look at some finances this weekend, then bring the commitment card next week and do it next weekend. But give whatever the Lord tells you to give, please, and make the commitment that God tells you to make. Okay? Everyone okay with that? Yeah. All right. Uh, let, me, let me pray for you, and then after I pray, we'll stand at all the campuses and we'll have a worship song, and during that worship song, I want you to come and give your offering and your commitment to the Lord, your commitment card, okay? Lord, I feel like David when he said, who are we to be able to give to you so willingly because it came from you, and now we're able to give to you. And Lord, I also feel like David in that he rejoiced because he saw the people that you gave him to lead. They're your people, Lord, and I know that. But he saw them give so willingly. And Lord, I thank you that Gateway gives willingly. And Lord, I ask you to bless and protect every family in Gateway. Lord, I ask that you protect their finances. I ask that you protect their health, their marriage, their family, their kids, their relationships in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray that you'll speak to us, that you'll speak to every family. What offering do I give and what commitment do I make? And so, Lord, will you now receive this offering for your glory? In Jesus' name, amen.